7 o'clock. It's time to begin our service tonight. Let's go ahead and stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time together. Father, this time of, of souls of men and women come to seek your face, Father. Come receptive and with cup ups, cups uplifted to the Holy Spirit of God, ready to receive whatever you have for us, ready to receive and fell you. Father, your truths and your mysteries, the pearls that you have given to your children. Father, let your will be accomplished within us tonight. Let it be accomplished in all of us. As we come before you ready to receive, ready to trust and believe upon your every word tonight, Father, we give you our praise and our honor, all the glory and the honor tonight. It is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a hymnal tonight. Let's sing a couple of songs, shall we? Page 250. Let's sing about that place we're all headed to. Amen. And we get some latecomers straggling. Don't mind them. They'll just come in and they'll sing right along with us. All right? Page 250. I'm on my way. about it. Oh. 
Jesus Christ, the light of hope shining into darkness, the light of hope shining into helplessness and hopelessness and despair. There is always hope in you, Father. There is always hope in your word, in your spirit. Your mercy is boundless. It endures forever, and we praise you for it tonight. Father, you've shown us such mercy as that. Help us shine the light of your gospel, the light of salvation, the light of a new start, of second chances, the light of forgiveness, and of, and of a new birth. Father, we thank you for this. We bless you for it tonight. Help us shine it into the lives of others for your glory and your glory back to midweek service and some people that are still either A, sick or B, traveling or uh, in one case uh, we've got a fella in the hospital and I'll make an announcement here in, the morning, in a moment. We need to be keeping him in prayer. Uh, he was in an accident last night but we'll get to all that here in a moment. Let's intend to really get a blessing from God tonight. Amen? Now, I know we don't have huge crowds uh, filling up the church tonight. We're not packing the pews out. We don't have them standing room only in the vestibule. I don't think we did vestibule seating since uh, social distancing uh, during the worst of the, of the irrational COVID panic. But we did some of that. And so, But however many or few there may be, you're here, you're hungry, be hungry, and let God fill you up tonight. Amen. I have every intention of that. I have a message that I was working on this afternoon. It's been on my heart for days. A phrase that's just kept coming to mind over and over again about pearls. It's, what? Yeah, pearls. Some of you might know already what I'm talking about, but God knows, and we'll get to that here. Lord willing, by and by. But please stay in prayer for those that are just not well. They're still fighting off illnesses. And do please keep Brother Anthony Martinez in your prayers. We got a phone call uh, last night, just as we were leaving our home Bible study up in Wheatland, we got a call that he was in an accident and busted himself up pretty good. I'm not going to give all the details and all that. He's a fairly private brother, but um, he's, he was headed to the hospital, to the emergency room, so we made a beeline for it. Took us the better part of an hour to get there, but we got there, and he went into emergency surgery last night. He came through it. He's doing better. He called me uh, early this afternoon uh, and uh, he gave a good report and it's, it's good. God is merciful. Amen. So please do keep him in your prayers. We want to see that brother make a fast recovery. Amen. A quick recovery and then brought back here with us in one piece. Amen. That's usually how we prefer to be in one piece and functioning. So we thank you in advance for your prayers. But at this time, let's go ahead and receive, if we may, the Thursday night tithe and offering. We know all Christians tithe as per the word of God and give in offerings willingly as unto the Lord and that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Brother, would you please pray? Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you've given each and every one of us, Lord. Bless the gifts and the givers tonight in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> enough, maybe too often, is not taken for granted, is appreciated every dollar of it, helps make all of this and keep all of this possible, amen. And I want to read to you tonight, out of the Gospel of Matthew, first of all, welcome back to our missionary, no, we didn't send her out, but God wanted her there, she went there, she was uh, part of the, the team that went over to the Ukraine, and uh, that was a pretty risky place to go. But God kept his hand on all of that. 
And uh, we kept you in our prayers the whole time. Welcome back. I'm glad that you made it back in one piece and alive and all of that. And uh, welcome back. Matthew chapter 13. Please keep her brother in your prayers also. He's still over there. He's going to be over there, I think, for about another week, is it, sister? And then he'll be headed back to the States. Okay, so he's still over there. I don't think they're necessarily dodging bullets, but I'm not on the ground over there, so I don't know what the Russians are going to do, what the Ukrainians are going to do in response, or who's doing what. So your prayers are appreciated, and the Lord bless you for them. Matthew chapter 13 tonight. Just a couple verses of scripture I'd like to share, beginning in verse 44, if I may. Matthew 13, 44. Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought them. Mm, should we share one more? Can't hurt, can it? I don't think we'll lose the context if we do. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good in vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? That's a good teacher right there. Someone who asks, Do you understand what I've just shared with you rather than just throwing it out there and hoping that it sticks? It's a good thing to do. Get some feedback and see. Sister can identify with that. You taught kids for years, didn't you? Good thing to ask. Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Now I want to leave that there and back up to verse 44, actually part of verse 44 again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Let us pray. I want to ask Brother John, sir, would you please pray for us tonight? Pray for the message tonight, those of us that are here. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. And let me pull again from the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. With the help of the Lord tonight, I want to preach to you for a little while about found treasures. Found treasures. Treasures, or actually it could use a, a more of a contemporary term, found money, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. And that phrase, found money, that's not just something made up. That's a phrase it's used in economics, and it refers to money that has been rediscovered after being forgotten about. Rediscovered after it's been forgotten about or abandoned by its rightful owner. And it means exactly what it says. Found money, big surprise. You ready for this? Found money means found money. That's exactly what it means. Nothing deeper than that. Money that has been lost, ignored, abandoned, forgotten about, and then found by someone else. And who doesn't get excited by that sort of thing? Now, don't play pious with me tonight, all right? Oh, I don't care about money. Money is filthy. Money is the root of all evil. Whatever. Read your Bible again. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money is like a hammer or a screwdriver or a pair of tweezers. 
It's just a tool that is used either for good, either for bad. And not to try to capitalize on the, tra the recent tragedy of the last couple of days and another school shooting. But right on the heels of that, they're going for the same drama that they always go for and try to ban all guns and everything because they think that guns are evil and just fly around in the air shooting people randomly. We know that it doesn't work that way. And just like... Guns don't actually kill people, but it is the evil people with evil intent that kill other people. Likewise, money is not evil. It is just a tool either way. It makes a wonderful servant, and it makes an absolutely terrible master. Amen. So we don't condemn it, neither do we worship it. It is what it is. And about who doesn't get excited by a stray $10 bill found in a gutter? That actually happened to me one time. I was walking up to the bus stop. I was in third grade, I remember, because, you know, you just remember cer certain random things. I think third grade was the only year I rode the bus. It was a school integration thing they had going on. But walking up to the bus stop, I found just laid out flat and soaking wet as rainwater was pouring down through that gutter. A br I won't say a brand new, but it's brand new to me. $10 bill just laying there. What third grader doesn't go ape over a sudden free $10 that comes his way? Or like a, a $20 bill that you pull out of the pocket of some secondhand coat you bought at the Goodwill. It's an exciting thing. It has an immediate effect on people, doesn't it? No, it doesn't mean that they're in love with money, but it does mean that lunch is probably going to be free that day, or at least may as well be. Am I the only one that gets jazzed about that? I know you do. Don't even try that. All right, okay, so my wife is honest. Everybody else is just like, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, fine. That's fine. But it's exciting. It has an effect on people because it represents an unexpected windfall, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot. A lot of times found money gets used uh, as a phrase when someone comes across, say, a suitcase full of cash or some forgotten asset squirreled away in a foreign account somewhere that actually comes to light again. You know, like you always get emails about from Nigeria and places like that saying that this can be yours. Just, you know, contribute this information to me and it'll one hundred million dollars. We'll we'll send it to you. We'll split it with you. And it's always a scam. But sometimes such things are found just never for you and never for me. Right. Found money is exciting. We'll grant that it is. And one of my favorite parables here. And I really love this. I love this one about the treasure hidden in the field. And I love this one about, about the merchant man seeking goodly pearls buy, to, to buy and sell and all of that. I love that because, because it speaks of something that is beyond value. Here in the words of our Savior describes to us the very same thing as found money, only immeasurably magnified because of the value of the treasure that is found in this parable. So well, what's the treasure? How about the whole, king of, the whole kingdom of heaven? How about the entire kingdom of God? He said that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. It's like this merchant man that finds this one pearl of exquisite price, of, of exceptional value and rarity, and he sells everything that he's got. And the man that finds a treasure in the field does the same thing. It speaks of something that is worth more than can be calculated with a dollar bill. Now we're going somewhere very specific with this message tonight. This isn't just a vague thing, just trying to air it out there to get us, some of us to shout amen, although it'd be nice to hear it, amen, 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 amen. there we go, found some fire in our blood there, thank you Jesus. But that's exactly what is offered in God through Jesus Christ, what? The kingdom of heaven, the treasure hid in the field. The pearl of great price. All these metaphors that speak of that which is beyond value, that which is worth absolutely everything that we have and absolutely everything that we are. But it's only valuable like anything else. And it's a quick lesson in economics. I wasn't planning on bringing this up, but long ago, many years ago, I was asked this question by somebody who knew what he was talking about on the matter. He said, uh, and I don't remember what it was, so we'll just, uh, I'll just grab any example. What is an automobile worth? 
Well, automatically our brains start to calculating, right? Well, that depends on the car, that depends on the automobile, the make, the model. How old is it? How many miles? What kind of condition is it in? Is the paint all sketchy looking because it sat out in the sun for 15 years? You know, uh, I can't answer that question, uh, uh, preacher, because there's just too many variables. Nope, there's one very specific answer that is 100% accurate all the time. How much is a car worth? How much is anything worth? Whatever someone's willing to pay for it. And so value becomes subjective then. It really does. We have this treasure offered. And if we're in Christ, if we're genuinely born again, we have that treasure already. So this isn't something that I'm trying to sell to those of us that already have it. I'm not selling anything anyway. We shovel out what we do here. We fry it up, if you will, and serve it hot and fresh, and we give it out for free. And yes, we give in offerings, and we pay our tithes and all of that. We do that because it's our duty as unto God, and He's commanded as such. But we give this away whether somebody tithes or not. Amen. We really do. And we do it willingly. So what's something worth? Whatever someone is willing to pay. But if someone doesn't value something, then it's of no value to them. Thus, our Lord tells us a few chapters before this over in Matthew 5, do not cast your pearls before swine. Why? Because pearls are valuable. Not to go into a long uh, soliloquy about the value of pearls, but it's understood that they're worth something. I don't know if they're worth what they used to be, but people generally count them as something that's precious. And so you cast out that which is precious in an effort to share them with others. But what does swine care about pearls? What does swine care about gold? What does swine care about your bank account or that $20 bill you found in the gutter or pulled out of that used suit from the Goodwill? Do I have any of that right? No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> nope. That's all right. God still takes care of me. Amen. It does not worth anything to swine because swine don't care. He says, don't cast your pearls before swine. He wasn't talking about literal pigs and literal pearls. You know it was a metaphor because when you cast out, when you share that divine treasure that we have because of God through Jesus Christ, when you, when you share that with people who have no interest in it and that do not value what you have, then one, they're going to think that you're attacking them, and two, they're going to turn on you just like Jesus said lest they trample your pearls underfoot and turn again and rend you. And so, yes, we share what we have, and we share it free of charge, but not everybody values it. So we don't necessarily go out there in the street with a bullhorn or with an amplifier and a microphone and engage in street preaching. No, it's not wrong. It Maybe it, it could be a blessing. I rejoice when I see someone doing that, but it isn't always well received. See who's swine and see who's a wise merchant. See who will value what you have to offer as far as your treasure in heaven, your spiritual wealth in God. See who is worthy of it. And then if they're not like Jesus said, save your effort, knock the dust off your shoes as a testimony against them and move along and find someone who wants to hear it. Amen. Now, we believe in evangelism. You know us. We're all about it in this church. And we do it all the time, organized, casually. We do it as often as we do. It as often as we do. And it's every week, and sometimes it's many times a week. And, and God blesses. He really does. But we don't waste our time with people who make it clear that they don't want what God offers. Once they make that clear, hey, God bless you, sir. We don't pick fights. We don't anathematize them on the spot, rebuke them in the name of Jesus, put a sour taste in their mouth worse than is already there. We just wish them well, and down the road we go. All this just by way of an introduction. We're nowhere near the heart of the message just yet. Let's see if we can get there in a timely fashion. What God offers us 
is that treasure. What God offers to everyone who will value it is that treasure. And it's worth more than a country club membership or, or even American citizenship or anything else at all in this life. And yet it is so often treated by unbelievers as a thing without value. And by even many believers, it is treated as a burdensome obli obligation or as an impossible dream they don't think that they can really attain. Did you know a lot of Christians actually think about it? They think of the kingdom of heaven that way. They think it's just some impossibly high, far, distant, lofty thing that they don't really think that they're going to enter into. And it's a mistake to think of it that way because Jesus even tells us plainly that the kingdom of God is found in you and I. It's already attained. I want to cement that point real solid-like before we move on to the next one. It's already attained. It's already in our possession. No, we haven't stepped through the gates, so to speak. No, we have not yet put on immortality. We have not yet put on incorruption, as we've been uh, talking about a little bit in the Bible, in both Bible studies, uh, uh, a little bit about how, uh, how our, in 2 Corinthians, he says how uh, we groan to be, to be shed of this earthly tabernacle that we may put on that heavenly one, that eternal one from above, that one that, will not grow, that won't get sick, that will never grow old, that will never be subject to death or the ravages of old age. We long to be clothed in that, that we may live eternally in body as well as in spirit and in soul. I'm still not done beating the drum on that because that's something that so many times we did. It's out of sight, out of mind, isn't it? You know, because we're not there yet. And so uh, we, we, we just, it, it, we focus so much on the things that are closest to us or that, are, we, that we perceive to be more immediately needful, the money we need to pay the bills or, or this chore that's got to be done or the tooth that we have to get extracted because it's falling apart in your head and has been for years. I don't know what all's going on in your dental history, but thou knowest and so does God. That's me oversharing again, by the way. I got to get one pulled on Tuesday. Went in there today because it's been hurting. No, no big deal. They went and looked at it. That tooth has got to go. All right. I didn't even fight. I didn't even argue with them, not try to save it because it's all broken and it's just not in good shape at all. So out that will come. But we tend to focus on those things. We focus on the needful and immediate things and, and things that seem impossibly distant or impractically distant. Then, then we just, it just, we don't spend as much time meditating on it as we ought to to keep the hope of it alive in our hearts. That's how we keep our eyes on the prize. That's how we keep our eyes on Jesus so many times. Isn't always just the hardships that we endure, but isn't that our eternal hope? Has it just become so old hat to us? Come on, I'm talking to folks that have been saved for years now. Has it just become old hat? Oh, yeah, it's another message about heaven. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I'll get there one day, by and by, by and by. I never heard that phrase, I don't think, until I became a Christian. By and by, it's outdated, I guess, but we still use it in some of the things we talk about and sing about. Well, this raises the question, especially if we don't think about it often. Do we really value that kingdom? Or do we treat it more like an old suit ready for the kook store. Sorry, second-hand store. Got that name from someone else. Because it used to be the only people that shopped at second-hand stores were crazy folks, but not so much now. I've shopped at them many times, continue to, when it's a blessing to do so, and I actually want to find some trousers that fit. Excuse me. There's a little bit of bitterness in that, but only a little, I promise, just a little. Pray for me. Good evening, everybody. Are we? Can we do some jump, stretches, jumping jacks Thursday night? Maybe you had a hard day at work. That's whatever. We'll just go on. 
So it raises that question, do we value it or do we treat it like something worn out? Do we treat it like something old hat? Do we treat it like something that we've become so familiar with that it doesn't hold any more wonder? It doesn't hold any more delight or wonder in our minds and in our imaginations. What's it going to be like? How will we be? How is it actually going to play out? What will we do when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun? What is it going to be? Is it going to be like the cartoons I grew up with and we just strum harps and float on clouds? Or is it going to be something great? and grander and more magnificent than that. Surely it will be something far greater than that. I'm, I'm absolutely positive. No doubt at all in my mind. And you comb through the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, and you find every prophecy that speaks about what the world will be like with the sun seven times brighter and no oceans upon the earth and, and there will be no nighttime there. I'm taking that from a hymn, but, but it's, it's just as good in this case. It really is. It's just as good. Do we think on that? Do we think about that city and, and the streets that are made of gold? Do we think about, about the size of it and the gates and the stones that, that all refer to the tribes of Israel and all of that? Do we think about God and His glory? Do we value that kingdom? which we already possess within each and every single one of us. Now, don't worry, I'm not about to get too esoteric with this, but it raises the question, do we value it? And I want to start by declaring what should be obvious. It is worth something. It is absolutely worth something. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. He didn't say it was like a new car or a prestigious job title or any of the other junk that this life has to offer. He didn't liken it to anything like that. Nothing so passing. He said it was like a treasure, a treasure hidden in a field, unclaimed, unknown of, worth a tremendous fortune and available. Think on that now. Think on that now. It's like that. It's exactly unclaimed, unknown, worth a fortune, available. Think of the treasure maps that you used to draw, perhaps, if you had any imagination when you were six. Think of the treasure maps that you used to draw when you were a kid. And, and you know, they didn't go anywhere, but, but you like to think that, it, what's Siri waking up for? This thing, I'm telling you, Think of those things, all right? Think of those things. Maybe you buried something that you counted as precious to you just so you could draw a map to it and it felt like you had a secret buried deep in your heart and you got giddy and excited about it and you thought, I'll dig this up in a few weeks, but you didn't last two hours because it was something that needed to be dug up and you were a kid and you had no patience. That's just kind of how it is with, with human beings a lot of times. And so you went and you dug it up and it was really cool and then it was exciting to you. Only this treasure, this treasure that our Lord speaks of has not been stolen. It has only been hidden. Hidden. So why would he do that? Well, what did we learn in 2 Corinthians in the Bible studies? Those of you that come to the Bible studies, you know what we're talking about. Those of you that don't, you're missing out. You ought to break away. Come on a Tuesday night. It won't kill you. You'll have an overdose of church attendance. No such Thing. The early church met every day, didn't they? All the time. I know they had to break some of that up when some things got out of hand, but, but still, it's good to do. Covet the company and the fellowship of the saints. This treasure was hidden. Why would it be hidden? Hidden from the eyes of fallen man. In Corinthians, he talks about that. If this treasure be hid, if this thing that we have from God is hidden at all, it is hidden to them that are lost. Why? Because they don't have eyes to see it or recognize it or value it until their hearts are enlightened to it by God. Just like yours had to be. Just like mine had to be. So I was raised in the faith. I always knew about it. But when did you first realize its real value? Come on now. You who grew up in Christian homes, you know what I'm talking about. 
There, there, there was a change, or there needed to be. There needs to be, if it hasn't happened yet. There needed to be a change in there at some point where you weren't just hearing about Bible studies or Bible stories anymore. It wasn't just stories anymore, but something woke up inside you. Something turned on inside your heart, inside your mind, and you realized with, with new appreciation that this wasn't just a story. It was something personal, and it was something that was available for you to possess are we hitting the target tonight it really did had to and some the one of the, that's one of the reasons why some of the hardest people in the world to even get saved are preachers kids because they hear about it over and over and over again they hear about it the Sunday school teachers kids they always hear about it and so it just becomes another list of stories that get tired of hearing until they finally come to realize that they really need what they've been hearing about and that just because they've heard about it all their lives doesn't mean that they possessed it. The difference between knowing there's a car in the garage and actually getting in that thing, putting the key in the ignition, firing that engine up and driving it yourself. Amen. Like anything that God gives, we have to be willing to receive. That's why some people never receive the Holy Ghost. It's not because they can't. It's because they're still sitting at the table with their eyes shut saying, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. And they rob themselves of the power of God to walk and live an upright life. They rob themselves of comfort. They rob themselves of all that comes with Him. They do. They do it all the time. Common as mud. But we don't have to do that. We can open our eyes and stare bold, stare bold faced into the word of God and say that promise is for me. And that promise is for me. And that promise is for me. And this one here and this one here and all these others over here. These promises are for me. Why? Because I've been born again by the spirit of God. And all his promises in God to me are yes and amen. And they're that way to you. And they're that way to you. And they're that way to every one of us that are here in this house tonight. I don't back down from that. I don't care who gets offended. We need all of it. And we need all of him. A treasure hidden in a field. A treasure hidden in a field. And it's like that. It very much is like that. And so that treasure is there, hidden, yes, but to those that don't value it yet. But anyone who's ever heard the gospel has been told about it and has been offered this very treasure. And it is worth more than everything a man or a woman has. I can't beat that drum hard enough either or often enough either. It's worth more. It's worth more. It's worth more than our money. It's worth more than our possessions. It's worth more than our pride. It's worth more than our vanity. It's worth more than anything else. It's worth more than our life. It's worth that. It's worth that. More than pride, vanity, more than any success of, earth, of any earthly kind, more than money or family even. It's worth more than family. You know what? Jesus said as much, didn't he? If any man loves mother or father more than me, he's not worthy of me. If any man loves son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of me. If you love your wife more than you love God, you have an idol. Amen? If you love your husband more than you love God, you have an idol, a false god, one that you have to get permission from before you do anything for the Lord. Sorry, that's uh, getting a little specific, but it's a lot of people's relationships that are like that. They're like that. Not to get into, I don't want to rabbit trail and all of that, but really, the kingdom is worth more even than family. Now, don't misunderstand me. We believe in family. I believe in family. I have a family. I have a father that I dearly love. I had a mother whom I dearly loved and still love. I mean, 
That makes no sense to continue to love someone even after they've passed away. Tells you that love is far more than just a biological impulse. It's something that is real and divine. It is timeless. It is eternal. It is of God himself. It really is. And I have a mother that I still love, though she's, she's, uh, she has passed away and has gone on to her eternal reward, whatever and wherever that may be. And I have a brother that I love. And I have a daughter that I love. And I have a wife that I love. Family is good, but family grows old and family passes away. And sometimes families make mistakes. Sometimes loved ones do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. We've got to value the kingdom of God more than even our own blood. No, you don't have to hate your parents. I don't believe in that. I know what Jesus said. You know, if you know anything about Jesus, that he didn't mean to actually hate someone. God is love. And if God abides in us, and He should be abiding in us, then we love also, and we can love, and we do love with a perfect and a selfless love. What in Greek is called agape. And it, and, and it doesn't expect anything in return. It may hope, but it does not necessarily ex expect. But we must value the kingdom more. Read the reaction of this man in this parable. And it wasn't a literal man. It was a parable. But you read his reaction in there. This man who, had, who, had, who otherwise was going about his own business. Perhaps buying or selling like the merchant man. Uh, in the very next parable, maybe he was just traveling for business or for pleasure. Maybe he was like a couple of our sisters, our globe-trotting, nature-hiking uh, Fishing, skydiving, daring death in the eyes. What's wrong with the ground? It's perfectly good ground. Why don't you want to just walk on that? You know? No, I want to jump out of this perfectly good thing. <laughs> hey, have at it. If, you know what? If that brings you joy, knock yourself out. Uh, don't knock yourself out, but have fun. There you go. And, and uh, pray that your parachute doesn't malfunction. And, uh, and that you land safely and say, okay, that was an experience. Now maybe I'll do something less risky. Maybe he was on his way to skydive or parasail. Perhaps he was on his way to commit a crime. Maybe he was on his way to end it all because he found no lasting he found no lasting joy in what he had. He had money. Had a house. Nice house. Had maybe the best chariot money could buy. Electric door lock. Had nice clothes. They weren't just cheap trash that everybody's selling now. It pills up when you look at it. He had things realize like Solomon the hard way that without God really in your life it ain't worth anything it just isn't it's just more devices to fill up 24 hours in a day it's just more possessions to give a superficial appearance like social media that someone's life is exciting and fun and wonderful, and they're the happiest people ever. And maybe he realized all of that, perhaps looking for the treasure on a rumor or on a hunch, like men and women are doing right now, searching for meaning in life, searching for something that's actually worth something, and not just another passing trend. Greek philosophies are making, have been making a resurgence in the last few years, especially Stoicism. That's curious. Imagine that, people rediscovering that discipline is actually good for a person. It's a shame that they're having to find that in a dead Greek philosopher when they could find that pearl of wisdom right here. Greeks never had the market cornered on any of that. You want wisdom? You want wisdom? Crack open Proverbs and bury yourself in it for a while. And don't speed read it because you're trying to win a contest. Just bury yourself in it, immerse yourself in it, meditate on it, think on it. 
and make it a part of who you are and show that you're really a disciple of our Lord Jesus and not merely a religious person or a student of religion. This man found in this parable, yes, it's a parable, he found that treasure. And what did he do? He rejoiced at its discovery. Shouted whatever the Hebrew version of Eureka is. I don't know. Because he recognized what he found. I've found something that's worth more than everything I own. I've found something that's worth more than everything in the world. He rejoiced at the discovery and he took immediate action. He did not dawdle. He did not call up a financial advisor. He did not call his mom and dad and say, hey, check out what I found so that his mom could sneak in there behind and, and, and take the treasure from him. He didn't do any of that. He took immediate action. We don't read of his stealing the treasure. I want to be clear about that. He didn't steal the treasure for certainly the field was owned by someone. But he hid that thing so that no one else would find it. You ever done that in a store when you found something that you really needed to get or wanted to get? It was just the right thing, whatever it was. But there was only like one left. And you're like, oh man, I need this. But I forgot my wallet. Um, uh, I'll stick it all the way in the back of this shelf and hide it behind a whole bunch of stuff and then I'll come back for it later today. Well, that's what the guy just said. That's evil. You shouldn't do that. Whatever. That's what this guy did in the parable. He hid that thing and then he went and he sold everything he had on Craigslist, eBay, OfferUp, Facebook, and any other platform that he could. He took the money and he bought the whole field. He bought the whole field so he could lawfully own it. That tre the treasure was worth more than the field. That treasure was worth more than the field that it was hidden in. And that's, uh, that's so true in so many things in this life that the heart of something is worth far more than the packaging that it's in. At least if you're an adult, you recognize that. It's only children, it's only small children that value the packaging more. And they do, I know, it's often joked about. It is. He went and he bought it. He hit it again, sold everything that he had. That proved its value. That goes back to that economic question, doesn't it? How much is a thing worth? It's worth what someone is willing to sell. And if you're smart, you recognize the value in something. He had, he, had, he had the right attitude about it. Maybe it was a little that he had. And maybe that it was a lot. But it was all that he had except the clothes on his back. And maybe even that, perhaps. Why? Because he understood its value. Not like, this, not, like, not like that son of that World War II veteran who sold that old Japanese sword in a garage sale for like 30 bucks, only to find out later on that it was worth thousands of dollars. He didn't understand the value of it. This man understood the value of it. And yet, and yet, and this is the heart of the message tonight, many Christians treat the kingdom of heaven just like that. They value it no more than some garage sale junk. And they part with it. Listen to me now. They part with it for next to nothing. Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. What a fool to do such a thing. To have once possessed the kingdom. The treasure hid in the field. And then to trade it off for the world? Preacher, you don't know what's in the world. Oh, yes, I do. I was born in it. I was raised in it. I was altogether of it. I know what it has to offer. I'll take the kingdom, thank you. Because this world Every brick, every tire, every dollar, every garment, it's going to burn. And there will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth. But what God has for me and you is a kingdom that will not pass away. Regimes rise and fall all the time. Governments change, parties shift, all this stuff that we 
pump our heads so full of and we look at the news or read a newspaper or, or look at headlines on Facebook or some other website or um, what was that guy he sold out, he used to be conservative, now he's just done, drudge, that guy. You know, wherever you get your news sources from. All these things that we read about, they all shift and they all change. And none of them last forever. But the kingdom does. Christians treat the kingdom far worse than they should. They value it far less than they should. Why? Why would they do that, you might ask? Why? Because those pearls were told not to cast before swine. They themselves have ceased to value. Here's the heart. Right here. Heart of the message. Do we still value our pearls? I've got pearls. No, not the silly things that come out of oysters. It's gross when you think about how they're formed. I don't know why people value those things. I guess they're pretty, but you know, it just goes to say, you know, don't look into the dirty secrets of the origins of good things, right? Because it can be messy or disgusting. I don't want to know how my wife makes the food. I don't want to know what goes in there. I don't want to know. What's got to, nope, sour cream, that's it. I'll never eat it again. Fails the eye test, fails the taste, it fails the texture, it fails everything. It's just awful. If you love sour cream, have at it. You can have mine. You know? But I've got pearls that are worth something. If you're born again, you've got pearls that are worth something. You have truths. Brother, you've got truths that, that speak to us how to live our life. And, and not just, it's not because God's a control freak trying to to keep us from having fun or do enjoyable things. That's a child's view of it. That's a, that's a sinner's view of it. They don't get it. They don't understand. It, it's valuable because when we live according to His Word, when we live according to His will, it works! Marriages work. What a novel idea. Families actually work. Unbelievable. Really? We have pearls that are worth far more. And anything the world's got to offer, the world's insane for what they've got. They've absolutely lost their marbles for what they have. But what we have is worth far, far more. And it lasts. Have we ceased to value our pearls just because we've been looking at them for so long? Well, does that maybe bring us to, does that maybe open our eyes to something that our pearls that we have in God, these gems, these jewels, these treasures, these hidden treasures that are no longer hidden to you and I, these things that we have are for more than just, than just brooding over like a dragon over its gold? That it's not something to be hoarded and then and eyeballed all the day long because anything gets old when you look at it long enough. Anything at all. Ask any child that gets tired of of its favorite toy, whatever it is, is does that kind of open our eyes to what those pearls are intended for? They are intended to live by and they are intended to share, to be spent upon those who will value them. You want to see a church dying a slow death? A church that has no outreach. A church that has no evangelical spirit to it. A church that just says, this is our little fellowship and this is just what we, this is just what we do. We get together and we have tea. I'm not knocking tea. I like tea. I drink tea. Okay? I'm not knocking fellowship. I thrive on fellowship. But we've got to have a vision of the lost. I know that this, this message just took a sharp turn. And maybe it's just, maybe it's just a quick, uh, a bypass, and we'll get right back on the main track. But there it is, right there. Do we still value our pearls? I do. I do because I know what those pearls did for me. And I know what they can do for somebody else. Pearls, they don't just fast track us to heaven. How small a vision. We just want to be done with this life and not do anything while we're here. How many years do we have? If all God wanted to do was get us into his presence, then he'd slay every one of us the moment we were born again, right? Sorry, I'm not trying to intimidate folks. I'm trying to not be all up in this, as I sometimes am. But, but do we value those pearls we have? Do we want to share them with someone? 
You present them to someone, they don't value it, that's fine. Cut their pearls away. Hey, that's fine. Just wanted to share with you, but hey, no bait. Pray for you. God bless you. And then you find someone that turns out, because you're following the leading of the Holy Ghost and you do this a lot of times, you find that one that you, never, you didn't even know they were praying. They were praying for a church to attend. So God doesn't do that. Ask that woman back there at the media station. She'll tell you her story. Because that was her. 20 years ago. Almost. 20 years ago. Our pearls are valuable. And they're useful. We should spend them. Do you understand what I mean by that? Here, I'm trying to be a good teacher too. Do you understand what we mean by that? We don't just hoard the mysteries of heaven to ourselves greedily or thinking that no one will appreciate what we appreciate. Really? There are people out there right now dying for what you and I have. How about it? You want to spend them pearls? Let's spend some pearls. Let's find someone in a bad way. They don't have to be strung out. They don't have to be the worst case you find, but, but everybody out there is in need of this treasure we hold in earthen vessels. Pearls tonight, and we've hit the heart of this. There's more at the chair, but I think it's time to pray. And as we bow our heads and close our eyes tonight in reverence to God, pearls treasures, not gold, not silver, not money, not stocks or bonds, whatever those are even worth, who knows, from one month to another. Not any of the things that people count valuable that can be touched and handled, but this treasure hid in the field, this treasure that is worth everything we have. What's that treasure worth to you? What are those pearls worth to you tonight? They were worth Jesus' life. And they were worth Jesus' death. And it's worth your life too. It's worth my life too. It's worth our lives to say to God, our Father, to say to Him, I will value what you have given to me. I will not treat it cheaply. I will not offer it for sale. God, I will do something with the treasure you led me to. I will do something with the pearls you have filled my hands with. I will do something. I will value them for myself and I will share them with someone who needs them and will appreciate them. I will do it. With your help, I will do it. By your grace, I will do it. It's worth it. It's in you. We have that treasure in us. And it's only when we do that we can really, really live. Brothers and sisters, these altars are open. Let's come. Let's come and let's find a place to pray tonight. Let's value again our pearls in Jesus Christ. God bless you as our prayer. Let's find a place to pray.
Remind me of times when Your Spirit moved and then Good in me for souls of men Father, bring back the new again Anointing me from within that my vision grows not dim, Lord, bring back the new again. Lord, I want to be your hand, extended out to man. Oh, let them see in me a real to believe any good Lord that I can do I pray they know it's only you Lord it's in you I stand where all becomes new again Lord bring back the new again Remind me of times when Your Spirit moved and then Burdened me for souls of men Father, bring back the new again Anointing me from within that my vision grows not dim, Lord, bring back the new again. Extend it out to man. Oh, let them see in me a reason to believe any good Lord that I can do. I pray they know it's only you. Lord, it's in you. comes new again Lord bring back the new again remind me of times when your spirit moved and then burdened me for souls of men Father bring back the new again Anointing me from within That my vision grows not dim Lord, bring back the new again That my vision grows not dim Lord, bring back the new when you first believed, weren't they? They were, they were worth your dreams. They were worth your own ambitions. They were worth everything that you had. 
when you first embraced them, hidden in a field, you found it, God led you to it, opened your eyes and awakened your heart. Don't stop valuing your pearls in Jesus. Cling to them, share them, encourage one another in them, encourage one another in them and with them and share them with some desperate soul who is lost and needs something real, something genuinely valuable that will lead him to the cross of Christ and to the kingdom himself. Value your pearls. It's not a poetic title. There it is. Value them. Don't give them up. Share them. See what God can do. See what God can do in your life to touch the life of someone else. Please be in prayer for Brother Anthony, as we've already said. For those that may be facing other challenges, whatever they may be, pray for one another and value your prayers. Regular schedule this weekend, outreach this Saturday for those of you involved. Come and join us on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. Let's meet back here again. Let's value our pearls. Let's value God's kingdom and his immeasurable wealth for us. And let's meet back here at Sunday at 11 to worship again Sunday night at 630. God bless you tonight is our prayer. Brother David, sir, I'd like to ask you to dismiss us in prayer. Thank you, Father.